Thank you, thank you. If you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Thank you for those who are here tonight that were not here last night. Obviously, you had your own church to be at, but we appreciate you being here with us tonight. Uh, since we were not able, and by the way, thank you for the apple, whoever brings these for me. Uh, I do appreciate that. That looks like breakfast to me. But uh, since we didn't have the big fish fry tonight, which has sort of become a tradition here at Mount Vernon in this community, uh, I had received a gift card from somebody for Captain Joe's, so I decided I'd go by and, and uh, you know, use my gift card. And I went in and asked them, did they serve crabs? And they said, yeah, we serve everybody. Come on in. <laughs> but uh, I was off to a good start. Uh, but anyway, I get no respect. So it is good to see you all here tonight. Um, we're going to look at this. and We're going to stop at 8 o'clock or, or if we finish before 8 on this chapter. Uh, but I promise you we will not go past 8 o'clock, not on my part. I'll stop uh, maybe about 5 till and we'll have prayer. And uh, like I said last night, the, the Bible study in eternity is more important than the ball game. But I also realize that this is a unique situation, and I will make this prophecy. Uh, I don't work part-time for ESPN, but I'll make this prophecy. There will never again be a national championship game between Alabama and Georgia. The committee that makes the selection of the teams has taken a lot of heat this year for putting two SEC teams in it. And that will never happen again, I'm just telling you. So in a way it's a historical moment. It's sort of like one of the, like seeing the solar eclipse, you know, a while back. But uh, it'll never happen again. Georgia and Alabama may play again now but it won't be for the national championship because they'll never let two uh, teams from the same conference go again. But anyway, uh, we didn't come tonight to discuss that, but 1 Peter chapter 2 has, has two main things, really, that if we can get these, I don't understand every verse in it, I don't understand some of the words, but uh, two main thoughts. In the first part of the chapter, he deals with church unity. Folks, I could go to any church and talk about this, and people would think the preacher's been talking to me. I don't know anything here. I, the only thing I know about Mount Vernon is what I see on Facebook, and I don't know of anything. I don't know of any problem, but I guarantee you there is no church that cannot use a sermon on church unity. We all could use it. Uh, the second point in this thing is about submission. And it will actually carry over into chapter 3, but we won't go to chapter 3 tonight. That's going to leave us two nights with three chapters. So we'll just have to see how that works. But we'll tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about how to win a husband. So if you're a single girl here, you might want to come back tomorrow night. And uh, uh, so that will be on the docket for tomorrow but also about the spirits in prison too <laughs> tomorrow night. All right, this chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, and of course, understanding that the Word of God originally, Peter wrote this as just one letter, and then people came in and divided it up into chapters and verses. I was amazed. I looked that up a while back, and it, it was like not too many hundred years ago that they did that, you know. I I just figured about the first century they'd have divided it up, but it was a long time, maybe the 1500s or somewhere like that. But anyway, uh, we're, he's actually started uh, in the latter part of chapter 1 on this unity thing by saying in verse 22 that we were supposed to have sincere love for the brethren and love one another with a pure heart fervently. Uh, so he's already started that, but in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, he says, wherefore, laying aside. Now that expression, laying aside, means to cast off like you would uh, your shirt if it caught on fire. If, if your clothing caught on fire, you would immediately, you know, rip that shirt off. You'd look like Hulk Hogan 
ripping that thing apart, uh, getting that out of it. Um, and here are some things that a church will never be unified unless we get rid of these things he's about to tell us. And, and I don't know any church that's completely unified, but I'm just saying we need as much unity as we can. The first thing he says, lay aside malice. Malice means congealed anger. It means having an unforgiving spirit. It means having a chip on your shoulder. Uh, you can talk until the cows come home about how much you love Jesus, but if you have an unforgiving spirit, it's not worth the, you know, listening to you tell it. Malice will kill a church. It's unforgiveness. And most of the time, the stuff that people are mad about are things that happened years ago that we can't do anything about now anyway. And then he mentions uh, guile, G-U-I-L-E. Guile literally means, and this, this one should be understood here at Mount Vernon, it literally means to bait a hook. Now, you, you would immediately think in terms of a, of a fisherman. A fisherman, and, and some of you are, are you know, you, you do a lot of fishing and, and that's your sort of main hobby. But when you think about it, the fisherman deceives the fish. Now, I'm not saying that we should quit fishing. I'm just saying you've got a, you've got a hook, and I'm not an authority on fishing, but you've got a hook, and, and you put bait on it. But you don't put bait that you like. You don't put a piece of chocolate cake, you know, on that hook. You might like that, but the fish don't. So what you put is some kind of worm or artificial, you know, th something that that you move up and down in the water and the fish swims by and sees that thing moving around and the fish does not realize that by taking a bite out of that, he's getting hooked. But that's guile and uh, a lot of people use guile. It, it, uh, basically, it, it's a two-faced person. You know, the month of January is named for the Roman god Janus who supposedly had two faces he could look behind and ahead, and I thought, you know, well, that ain't no big deal. I know a lot of people with two faces, but y'all can't say that about me or I wouldn't be wearing this one if, if I had another one. But anyway, guile means to be deceptive, to manipulate. Have you ever had that happen to you? Doesn't that burn you up when you find out somebody's used you? That happened, that's happened to me a few times. In fact, I've even put stuff on Facebook that I have passed on that other people have put and found out later it wasn't really true. So I'm very careful now about that. I don't care if they say so-and-so is sick or whatever. You know, if I've never heard of these people, I'm not going to pass it on because uh, I got burned on that a while back. Uh, guile and then hypocrisy means to, to, uh, to pretend to be something you're not. It's one of the first words I ever learned from my daddy. My daddy, bless his heart, uh, he just thought everybody in church were hypocrites. And, uh, and so many people use that as an excuse not to come to church. And you'll find that out if you go out visiting, that uh, folks will tell you that the people at the church aren't what they claim to be, as if we don't know that. But the word um, hypo uh, hypocrisy comes uh, from the old Greek theater. See, the Greeks like theater. When I say theater, I'm talking about plays, not theater like we go to see a movie, but theater like where they did the plays and so forth. And uh, in, a, in the Greek theater, a person could play a role he would put a mask on, and that would identify what he was. Now, one person could play two or three different people, see, in the same play. All they'd have to do is do what? Change their mask. And so that's what a hypocrite is. It's somebody that hides behind a mask that appears to be religious on Sunday, but when they leave church, they take off that mask and put on another one, and they're totally different in the world than they are in the church. And we ha it is a problem. And then the word envies. Envy means you, you're upset because somebody else has got something that you want 
and, and they've got it and, and you would like to have it. And so you're envious. Maybe somebody else has been recognized um, over you. Maybe you, know, you felt like you should have been recognized and, and you did most of the work, but somebody else got the credit. And, and envy uh, is sort of a first cousin you know, to jealousy, which is the green-eyed monster, what they call it. And then evil speakings is the words for slander. It's the same meaning of, of the word slander. And the thing about slander or evil speaking is the person you're talking about is usually not there to give the facts. If y'all ever notice that when you hear things on people, it, they're not usually there uh, because if they were there, they could set the record straight. Um, now, sometimes, though, people will do this. I hope this doesn't happen in Appling County, but uh, we do have a few people in Jeff Davis County who will do this. They'll come up and say, have you heard about so-and-so? And, and then they proceed to tell you, you know, that they've run off and left their wife or uh, they've done so-and-so. And, -so and uh, just wanted to tell you so you could be praying about it. Well, they're not telling you about where you could pray about it. It's just evil speakings. All right, now, those five things, we've got to get rid of them if we're going to have unity in the church. And I don't know if you have any of them here at, uh, at Mount Vernon. I would assume that this is a regular, you know, I mean, I, I see you all about one, you know, once a, a year, but uh, I'm sure that there's as big as this church is, that there's some of this goes on. But it hinders the church. Now, when I say a church needs to be uni unified, I'm not saying that we all have to dress alike, that we all have to think alike, that we, uh, have, that we have to vote 100% on everything that's brought up in conference. But it, I just mean that we need to have one focus, one goal. For example, if I said that Mount Vernon needs to win people to Jesus, would all of you agree with that that's members here? Okay. We all, we all know that that's a priority. All right, but then when somebody brings up how can we best do that, then you may have different opinions. Somebody might say, well, I think we ought to go out and knock on every door and just go down the road here and start the first house we come to and knock on every door and witness. And, and you know, that's one way to do it. Others might say, well, let's uh, stream our services and then lost people can... They might not come to church, but they might look at that on the Internet. Somebody might say, well, I think we ought to maybe send them an email or call them on the phone or send them a card. Or, in other words, you have different ideas, but you have the same goal. The goal is to reach people. See, that's what I mean by being unified. I don't mean you have to think like a robot and be everybody in the church think exactly alike. But also we should learn to disagree without being disagreeable. And not to, if everything is not voted just the way we want, that we're going to pitch a fit and, you know, and keep up confusion uh, because we didn't get our way. But we need to be unified. So verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now when we become Christians, we are newborn babes. You could be 70 years old and be saved. And you'd be a newborn babe as far as a Christian. Now, we are to grow. Now, when you get saved, you're as saved as you'll ever be. But we can grow and become more godly as we grow older. And we need the milk of the word. In other words, Bible study should be a priority in churches. And I'm not saying that because... That's what I do. I mean, you don't have to have me. Somebody else could teach the Bible. But I'm saying today, most churches that are, quote, growing uh, are doing so by entertainment, not by the Word of God, not feeding them the milk of the Word, but feeding them with entertainment. And, uh, you know, if you do that, you can get people to come. But are, are they getting anything out of it? Verse 3, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Bible scholars tell us that that if there would be better translated since. Since you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, then you would be a witness, wouldn't you?
because you'd know what I was talking about. Verse 4, to whom coming, or now for several verses here, he talks about stones. And uh, I, I'm just going to summarize because, uh, you know, all this. But he says, we come as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Who do you think the living stone is, class? Jesus. Jesus. All right, he is the living stone. He's called the living stone because he arose from the dead. We don't have a dead Savior like the Muslims do and the Buddhists and, and all the other religions. Uh, he is a living stone. Okay? But he was disallowed of men. That means he was rejected by men. Remember John 1.11? It says, Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. But he says he's chosen of God and precious. Ye also, meaning us, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now Jesus is the true, he's the cornerstone. In fact, I believe he uses that term in verse 6. He is the cornerstone. When you build a building, a lot of, you know, they have a cornerstone. Y'all probably have one here. I don't get here in time to examine the building. Uh, about all I go to is the restroom and the pulpit. But uh, Jesus is the cornerstone. But if you're one of God's children, you are part of the, the, of the body of Christ. You are a stone in the body of Christ. We're not the head, you know, we're not the chief one. Jesus is. But, uh, and by the way, that would be true if you were saved and were a Methodist, if you were saved and were Church of God, if you were saved and were Assembly of God, if you were saved and non-denominational. In other words, the church is not made up just of Baptists. It's made up of those who love Jesus and those who have trusted Jesus and some people have different ideas, you know, about how to worship and all. And there's all kind of denominations. I mean, there's caboodles of denominations. But anyway, he says that we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, in the Old Testament, they offered up animal sacrifices. I'm glad we don't have to do that. I'll be honest. I, I don't, I, I, I just wouldn't have, I guess if I'd have been brought up, and that's all I'd ever known, it, it wouldn't seem unusual. But I wouldn't want to have to do that. But we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice according to Romans 12 and 1. Verse 6, wherefore it is also contained in the scripture. Aha, we have a clue here. Do you know what that means? He is quoting from somewhere else in the Bible. He says it is contained in the scripture. Meaning he's about to tell us something that is found somewhere else in the Bible. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. The scriptures, Isaiah 28, 16. That's what he's quoting here. I'll just be aware. You know, I told you last night we had one where it is written. Anytime you see something like this, you can check it out. He's quoting from the Old Testament here. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. If we were not in a Baptist church, we'd probably get an amen on that. If we were in a black church, we would get a bunch of amens. Unto you which believe, he is precious. I'd say he's precious. He's our only hope to get to heaven. If you've ever lost a child, that's your only hope that you'll ever see that child again is Jesus. He's precious, isn't he? But unto those which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And that's quoting from Psalm 118 and verse 22. Verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. Now, I had written down something, and wouldn't you know I have lost it. I must have left it at Captain Joe's. Uh, this makes me so angry. So I'm, I hope I can remember this. When you read the last phrase there, it says, whereunto they were appointed, 
you might get the idea that God has, has ordained or appointed that certain people are going to stumble or be rejected. Sort of goes along with what we were talking about last night, you know, with that election stuff. All right. Actually, when you read this in the Greek, he is saying this. Boy, it might be in my jacket, but I'm not going to go look it up. If we deliberately, willfully choose to disobey God, then we will stumble in our walk. In other words, God didn't make us stumble, but we disobeyed the word, and anybody that disobeys God's word is in trouble. Okay? That's what he means there. You almost have to turn the phrase backwards uh, to get the true meaning of it. Otherwise, you'll think that God had appointed these people to, to mess up. Verse 9, he says some very nice things about us, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Four things there. We're a chosen generation. Now back in what chapter 1, verse 1, remember he was writing to people who were scattered all over the place, five different provinces, yet he says you're a chosen people. You are a uh, royal priesthood, Based on that verse, every New Testament believer is a priest. In the Old Testament, you had to be a descendant of Levi. You had to be consecrated to be a priest. Only the priest was allowed to go into the temple and the tabernacle, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. But our position as priest is we can go into God's presence at any time. Now, you can come here and pray at the altar. That's a good place. But that's not the only place you have to pray. You can go home and get in your prayer closet. As a priest, you have access to God. See, I don't think we realize how blessed we really are. See, in the Old Testament, if you'd had somebody on the prayer list, like Brother Darrell mentioned tonight, you'd have to get the priest to pray. You wouldn't be able to go into God's presence, but we are able to, and we just don't do it. You know, we have the privilege of doing that. And then he says, a holy nation, meaning that we're a nation within a nation. We're not holy, but God is. And when we, God sees us as holy because of our faith in Christ. I love this one, though. He says, we're a peculiar people. As some Baptists have taken that literally. That doesn't mean we're a bunch of weirdos. The word peculiar there means we're people of his own. We belong to him. It doesn't mean we're to go around and act weird or anything. Uh, verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And in the past, see, we were not the people of God. That's actually, uh, he's probably referring there to the book of Hosea, chapter 1 and 2. Uh, Paul requoted it in Romans 9, 25 and 26, and Peter uh, requotes it here. So we're getting this uh, three times. But I also believe that Ephesians 2 and 1 would work here, that when we were sinners, we were dead in trespasses and sins, alienated from God, separated from God, outcasts. But now we've been brought into the family and made one of his children. All right? Dearly beloved, he says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Strangers and pilgrims there mean uh, aliens and exiles. People who were in another country, but they didn't really belong there. And they, had no, they were not citizens there. We live in this world, but this world is not our home. We're strangers and aliens here, pilgrims, just passing through. This is, not our, this is not our home here. But he says we're abstained from fleshly lust, but the fleshly lust war against the soul. The soul is our spirit. So you can see in that verse that Peter is saying that there will be constant conflict between the flesh and the spirit. We call it spiritual warfare. We don't do near enough preaching on it in our churches. But I mean, you know, we've got a lot to preach about, the whole Bible, but... Uh, you know, spiritual warfare, I'll guarantee you this, and Brother Darrell will know this, and most of you will know this, if a church begins to grow numerically, people coming and being saved, 
uh, you can watch out. The devil's going to try to pull some shenanigan to, to stop it. There's always a war against the spirit and the flesh. In verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Conversation there means your lifestyle. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what you say, but your lifestyle. Uh, that whereas they speak evil against you as evil, uh, speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. What he's saying there is when we're around a bunch of heathens, they, they ought to notice by our behavior that we're children of God. If we're going to act like them, then no wonder they're not interested in coming to our church when we have something. Uh, the day of visitation there is not clear. It's uh, probably the first really hard thing we've come to in the book. It's going to be some much harder stuff tomorrow night. But it could mean a, a time when God visits the lost and, you know, permits them to be saved, allows them to be saved. Or it could mean the day of visitation as in the judgment at the end when uh, everybody's, you know, not at the same time, but we're going to have to stand before God. It could be either one. Uh, if you held a gun to my head and said, stop this cut, you know, goofing off, tell me which one you think it is, I think it's referring to the judgment. That'll be a day when everybody's going to be visited. You'll be visited either at the first resurrection or the second one. But everybody, the saved will be at one, the lost will be at the other, and by the time God gets through, there won't be nobody left in the graveyard. Now, beginning in verse 13, the verses 1 to 12, basically we talked a lot about unity, getting along, all that stuff. Now we come to a word that we don't like. This is not going, you're not, this is not going to be your favorite part of the book. It's submission. And, and there's several things I'd like to say about submission, but, and I'll, I'll hurry as much as I can. Uh, submission is not slavery. If you submit to somebody, you're not their slave. You're just submitting to an authority. And Satan, to be honest with you, the devil was thrown out of heaven. Now pride was his problem, but he did not want to submit to God's authority. He wanted to be God. So he wanted God to change places with him. You'll find that in Isaiah 14, 13, and 14. Adam and Eve did not want to submit to authority. God told them what would happen if they ate of that forbidden fruit, and they did it anyway. Uh, because Satan convinced Eve that if, if she did that, she would have, be as God. In other words, she would have authority. And so, in the end, they lost their authority and their freedom. The prodigal son wanted uh, a, a freedom, so he left his daddy and went to a far country and ended up in the hog pen. He only found freedom when he came back and, and uh, obeyed the Father's will. So um, submission is not natural. It is natural for us to fight for our rights. And we live in a day when you cannot turn on the television that somebody isn't protesting something. And people want their rights, and there's groups, you know, that are fussing and protesting and and all that, but yet the Bible tells us to be submissive. Now, I am a citizen of heaven. Do I have to submit to earthly leaders? Let's see. Okay, let's see if we do or not. Notice in verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king, and in that day now, it would have been Nero, or unto governors. Now, they were not governors like Governor Nathan Deal, like you think of. They were people who were appointed by the king or the emperor, and they would rule over certain provinces. He says we are to uh, uh, submit ourselves uh, to these people as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. That verse 14 there tells us the purpose of government. They're to punish evildoers and praise those who do well. I don't think our government does either one. But anyway, God is the one who ordained government. 
So he ought to know more about it, right? I mean, since he's the one that came up with the idea. Now, we are to submit ourselves, but what if you don't like the president? We are still to honor that office. You do not have to like the man or woman who is the leader, but we are to be respectful, and folks, we have, we have seen in this past year a joke in the media. Whether they like President Trump or not, they have this, you know, it's like anything they can catch hold of to try to embarrass or smear him. And, and we need to have respect for, and even members of Congress don't have any respect for President Trump. But we are to respect our leaders. Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't do a very good job with Obama. I, I really probably could have, I, well, I could have, I mean, no doubt about it, I could have prayed more for him. If I'd have prayed as much for him as I talked about him, you know, things probably would have been better. I, I didn't really like George W. Bush. I didn't like Bill Clinton. Uh, so I'm just saying a lot of times because we don't like the leader, we feel like we don't have to obey them. But the Bible says we, we have to submit ourselves because even though we are citizens of heaven, we're having to live in the United States. You see, if you crossed the border and went into Mexico, you would be under Mexican laws. Even though you're a citizen of the United States, they could stop you in Mexico and charge you with something that is not illegal in the United States. And you can't say, hey, y'all can't do this to me because, you know, remember that soldier they locked up and kept him for months and months and all he did was make a wrong turn and went into Mexico. He thought he was, he was just mixed up on the interstate and they locked him up. We are citizens of heaven, but still we have to obey the laws of our leaders, whether we like our leaders or not. He goes on to say, verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. If we don't do right, see I put my thought for the day on Facebook today, I put about one every two or three months I used to put one on my board at school when I was teaching school every day. But my thought for the day today was don't, what did I say? Don't preach cream and live skim milk. <laughs> See, uh, I had 82 likes, Ashley, pretty good. You know, I, I was worried there about 11 o'clock. I only had one like, and that was me. But uh, a few people must have woke up. Anyway, but he says in verse 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Now it's a big word there, but all he means in verse 16 is we are free in Christ. We're not under the Mosaic law and, and dietary laws and all that kind of stuff, but yet we're to be careful not to use our freedom and, and go too far with it till it becomes what is called license. In other words, I am saved, I will stay saved, but I don't believe that I should do anything I want to and, and just to prove that I can stay saved. What did Paul say? Uh, where grace doth abound, uh, where, what was it? I'm getting it backwards. Uh, where evil doth abound, grace doth much more abound or whatever. Yes, I believe in once saved, always saved, but I don't believe we can just live any way we want to. And if we live just any way we want to, we probably aren't saved, to be honest with you. Because if we're saved, there'll be a difference. It won't be perfect, but there'll be a difference. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. All right? We're first of all to honor all men. Why should we honor all men? That may show respect. One of my favorite little quotes is be nice to people as you're climbing the ladder of success in the world because you'll meet the same ones when you're coming down. But we need to respect people. You know why? Because everybody's created in the image of God. Nobody in here tonight evolved from a piece of slime. You're created in the image of God. So we're to honor people 
And we are to love the brotherhood. That means we're to love other Christians. It doesn't necessarily tell us to love all people because some of them get on your nerves. But he says honor, honor people but love the brotherhood. And then he says fear God. But that means our fear is in a respect. I saw an illustration the other night. I probably shouldn't take time to tell it. But uh, this preacher was talking to a newlywed lady who had just been married a few weeks and she was telling him she was so excited because she was fixing her first home-cooked meal for her new husband. And she said, I was afraid I'd put too much, you know, this in. And I was afraid I'd put so much of this. She used the word fear three times. And finally that preacher stopped her and he says, why are you saying that? Are you afraid that if the meal doesn't turn out right that your husband will beat you? She said, no, I just want to please him. I'm afraid that, you know, if I don't fix a good meal, uh, he'll be disappointed in me. See, that's the way we need to be about God. You ought not to come to the Bible study just because Brother Darrell will be disappointed if you don't come or somebody will say, you ought to, say, you ought to just be afraid to displease God because he's done so much for you. Uh, that's the kind of fear here he's talking about. It's not a fear like, oh, I hope, you know, I'm just scared. Uh, I hope God doesn't notice I'm here, but we need to be afraid of displeasing him. See, that's why I study for this. Y'all might not think I study. I really do, especially for Mount Vernon, because you're the first church. But uh, then he says, oh, verses 18 on, he start, starts talking about servants. Now, actually, that word means slaves. And see, we don't really have anybody like this right now that we can relate to, because in Bible days, they believe that about 60 million people were in slavery in the Roman Empire. So a lot of people ask, why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? Why doesn't the Bible, you know, say more about it? Because if 60 million people back then had been freed at one time, it would have disrupted everything, the, whole, the economy, everything. But the Bible, if you believe the Bible, if you'll study history, you'll see that the people who fought slavery were, were Christians. It's not the devil's crowd. It was believers. But he says, so, so what a lot, of, a lot of people do here is they substitute, instead of the word servants, like a slave, uh, to talk about workers. Like you know, Most of you probably work for somebody else. Some of you may have your own business. You know, like these entrepreneurs, like these people that run these fancy places like the Holland Music Place, you know, and, and all this, you know, where they have these big name stars coming in. But uh, yeah, yeah, these folks that appear on the front page of the Baxley Banner and, and stuff like that. But uh, if we are a worker, he says we're to be subject to our masters, substitute the word your employer with a uh, that we're to be good to our employer. See, the best worker ought to be a Christian worker. Uh, the best mechanic ought to be a Christian mechanic. The best farmer ought to be a Christian farmer. Whatever we do, we ought to be our best at it because we're Christians. In other words, we're doing our best. And he says... Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Froward means harsh. If you ever had a bad boss, don't raise your hand. If you ever had a boss that was hard to get along with? Oh, there was a guy in Hazelhurst. He's one of my favorite people. He's one of the sweetest men in our county. In fact, he's one of the most godly men in our county. He used to have a place of business. And he had some employees that they're supposed to be there like at 8 o'clock. They drag in about 8.15, 8.30, you know. Used to just burn me up. And I didn't go up there but every now and then, but I'd see it. You know, I knew it was happening. And I talked to some of the other employees, and they didn't like it. And some of them even quit because, you know, the, the guy was just too tenderhearted. Uh, he should have laid down the law to them just to be on time, but they just come in. But we ought not to be like that. A Christian should not take a coffee break when he's supposed to be working. We ought to give our boss a good day of work for a day's wage. No, I'm not perfect. I'm just saying that's what we should do. Then he says, for this is thankworthy, verse 19, if a man for conscience, oh, now I'm going to be honest, I can't do this. 
I'm going to tell you what the Bible says, but now I'm not going to tell you to do what I do. He says, if you are accused here and treated wrongfully, you are to take it. Now, most of us would not. Most of us would fight back. If we were accused of something or mistreated by our boss, now, he does not mean for us to let people run over us, that we're to be doormats and just let people step on us, you know, and run over us. But he does mean in Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans 12, 18, Paul said, if possible, get along with everybody you can. I'm, I'm putting it in our language, you know. In other words, if as much as lieth in you, he said, be at peace with all men. See, some people won't let you be at peace. Some people will just keep stirring and keep stuff stirred up and you just can't get along with those people. All you can do is, is give them to the Lord. He doesn't mean to let everybody run over you, but he also doesn't mean that we're just to blow up and puff up when something goes wrong. We are to have a Christian attitude about it because that will impress your boss more than anything else. Verse 20, he says, though, for what glory is it when if you be buffeted, which means beaten, which were they did slaves back then, for your faults, you shall take it patiently. In other words, hey, if I've done something wrong and I am punished for it, I can't say I've been persecuted because I deserve to be You know, if I'm just slack and not doing what I'm supposed to be doing and then somebody calls me on the carpet for it, I can't just say, well, they're persecuting me because I'm a Christian. No, I'm getting persecuted because I'm sorry and lazy. And if we've done wrong, we can't, claim, we can't expect God to take our side. Now, he says, though, here is the classic example of submission. Was Jesus is our example. If he could be submissive, there ain't no excuse for the rest of us. I want you to understand here, he says in verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. A guy years ago wrote a book called In His Steps. I think it's the last book I ever read it's in high school. Um, nice book. I've still got it at the house. I need to dig that book up and see what he said. But, but now... Uh, Jesus was submissive. Here's a verse for, uh, we need all the children in here now. Uh, Luke 2.51. When Jesus was 12 years old, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem for the Passover. And when they left, it was a caravan, and, and Joseph thought he was with Mary, and Mary thought he was with Joseph, and they left him. And they went back in three days, and they found him in the temple. And the Bible says, though, that Jesus went down with them and was subject unto them. Can you believe that? If there's any child that ever had a right to sass his parents, it would have been Jesus. I mean, he's the one that created the world. You know, he could have easily, uh, uh, but he, he was subject unto them. Then when he became a grown man, he was subject to the authorities. Remember the time when they came to Jesus, wanted to tax Jesus didn't have any money and he sent Peter to catch a fish and opened his mouth and got a coin out to pay the taxes. He was submissive. Jesus, that's one reason they rejected him. They were looking for somebody that was going to lead an army and, and overthrow Rome. But Jesus goes around saying, love your enemies. Be, you know, be good to people. Then when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, was he submissive there? He said, Father, if there's any other way. But he said, if not, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Matthew 26, 39. Jesus was submissive unto death. If he could be submissive, me and you can. It's just that we don't want to be. We want to be in charge. We don't want people telling us what to do. So he says he was our example. But now, that's not how we're saved. Because the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and those groups, when they come to your door, they will tell you that Jesus was a great example. He lived a, a good example. If we're going to do that to try to get to heaven, you're going to run into a roadblock in verse 22. 
because verse 22 says, who did no sin. We can't go, see, a drowning man does not need an example. A drowning man needs a savior. If you're out in the Autumn Hall River and step in a hole and you can't swim and you bobble up to the surface and you go back under and you bobble up to the surface and you help, help, and somebody says, hey, watch me. I'm going to show you how to swim and I'm going to dive in and do a few laps. He don't need somebody to get, he needs somebody to pull him out. Me and you were lost and on our way to hell. We're not saved by Jesus' example. We're saved by his death. But he did leave us an example of how to live a Christian, as Christians. Verse 23, when he was reviled, that means insulted or, or humiliated, he did not revile back. In other words, when they, that was one of the things that Pilate just blew his mind. You know, they come, all kind of accusations against him and Jesus didn't say a word. Isaiah 53 said he would be like a lamb led to the slaughter, silent before his, the, his accusers. Well, we need to get to verse 24 because this is one of the most misunderstood verses in 1 Peter. It may be very well the number one misunderstood verse in 1 Peter. The TV preachers have done a good job muddying up the water here. It says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. What tree is he talking about there? The cross. Calvary, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness. Watch this phrase, by whose stripes you were healed. If you've ever watched a television preacher very long, they'll use this verse as a verse to claim healing. You send them money and sow your seed and by his stripes we're healed. In other words, they have all these people up there. You know, Oral Roberts, that's how he became famous was through the healing ministry. And they'd have people lined up, wheelchairs and all kind of things, you know, crutches. And, and uh, by his stripes, that's what they claim. But now look at the verse. It's a quote of Isaiah 53, verse 6. And it means the same thing in Isaiah as it does here, obviously. Watch this. Who his own self bear our what? sins it does not say he bore our flu and cold and, and uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all that on the cross he bore our sins there is going to ultimately be a day when we'll all be well Revelation 21 verse 4 says there will be no sickness and no death but that's in, that'll be in eternity in heaven that won't be now he bore our sins and that's what the verse is about. And when you pull out that last phrase and say, by his stripes we are healed, you are taking scripture out of context. That's why we have so much confusion today. Because most people don't read their Bible anyway, and all they know is what the preacher says. And he says, by his stripes you're healed. And it looks like we ought to all be healed. So I have a question. Why do we have a prayer list? Now I'm going to give you an example in the Bible to show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 to 9. Paul said he knew a man that was caught up to heaven. It was obviously him. And uh, he saw things there that he couldn't even tell us about. And then when he came back, you know, down to earth, uh, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. Well, we don't know what it was. Now, I know everybody's guessed at it and, you know, and all that. But there was something, and it was a thorn in the flesh. In other words, there was something wrong with him. He had a problem physically. It was in the flesh. And he prayed three distinct, I don't think he just prayed three times, but three distinct seasons of prayer for God to remove that thorn. And you know what God told him? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to take away that pain that you've got, that thorn. Whatever it was, I'm not going to take that away. But I'm going to give you the grace to bear it. Folks, you cannot use this verse and just say, all the sick people, by his stripes, you were healed. 
You don't need to be in a wheelchair. You don't need to be in a hospital bed. You need, if you got faith, get up and walk out. And, and see, I knew a man one time that uh, he was what we call a birth defect. He was, there somehow something went wrong when he was born and he was in a wheelchair all of his life. And several preachers would go by and talk to him and pray with him. And some of them told him if he had enough faith, he could get up out of that wheelchair. In other words, see the faith healers got it made. If, if something does happen and you get better, he gets the credit for it. If you don't get better, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Right. Either way, he's clear. Amen. See, But it's misusing scripture. That's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. It was his sins he died for on the tree. Now healing will ultimately be ours, but not in this life. Because we're all getting older. We're, you're going to find out when you get a little older that you're going to get weaker. And I don't care who you are, you know, it's going to change. All right, I got four minutes for this last verse. This has been a close call tonight. <laughs> for ye were as sheep, Going astray. See, that, that's, that, uh, I don't know if anybody in here taught English. Hopefully not. But the next church I'm going to uh, is a guy that teaches English. I'm trying to think up some ways to impress him. But uh, this is called a simile. You are as sheep. Sheep have no sense of direction. They wander off. They can't find their way back to the flock unless the shepherd goes and gets them. We were like sheep going astray, but are now returned, Paul, uh, Peter says, unto the shepherd. Notice that shepherds capitalize there. Who do you think that means? Jesus, the good shepherd. See, in the Old Testament, the sheep died for the shepherd. But in the New Testament, the shepherd died for the sheep. Jesus said, uh, I lay down my life for the sheep, John 10, 11. Now that word bishop means overseer, overseer. Jesus is not only our shepherd, but he's our overseer. He looks over us. How come I hadn't lost my salvation today? Because I've got an overseer. I had a shepherd that died for me, but I've got an overseer who keeps me in line. So he does both. He's the shepherd who went and found the lost sheep and he's the overseer because that's what he's been doing ever since he went back to heaven. I know most people think he's been date building our mansion for us. That mansion's already finished. The problem is we aren't finished. When we're finished, the mansion's there, <laughs> gonna be ready. Uh, but he is, Hebrews 7.25 says, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. I was in bad shape today about 12, 1 or 2 o'clock, I thought, how am I going to teach this chapter tonight? I don't understand this. But the overseer click, clicked in and helped me out tonight. Now, tomorrow night, to be honest with you, is probably the most interesting chapter of 1 Peter. I'm not trying to tell you that just for you to come. You come because you want to. I don't want you to come because of some promotional thing. But he is going to talk about husbands and wives some really good stuff. Every married couple ought to be here tomorrow night. Uh, Sheriff Mark Melton ought to be issuing subpoenas <laughs> to all the married people in this, in this area that, that uh, haven't been coming. Because, and then we'll talk about the most mysterious, difficult passage in 1 Peter, the spirits in prison. Tomorrow night. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Lord. We're one minute and 35 seconds ahead of schedule. That ought to give you all time to pledge allegiance to the national anthem when it's played tonight and not take a knee. All right. By the way, I heard that the NFL ratings were the worst. Oh, I loved it. On the, uh, for those playoff games they had this weekend, they said their ratings were about half of what they were. I said, thank you, Jesus. I'm not watching any of it. Uh, but anyway, that's... Now I'm only 55 seconds. I got, we got to pray. Lord, thank you for letting us be here tonight. Thank you for this wonderful second chapter that I loved once we got into it tonight. Please help us with the last three chapters, Lord, that we'll 
we don't expect to know everything, but to, enough to help us and, and uh, help us be better Christians. Help us now as we go home and leave here to be safe in Christ's name.